Well, good morning, everybody. It's, it's a light room this morning, and I don't mean from the sunshine. I mean, there's, there's not very many people here today. It's strange. Can you hear me okay, or should I? Okay, okay. And good morning, guests on Zoom. Um, we have uh, any visiting Rotarians today? I didn't see anybody come in. Okay, uh, technically, Rotaract, are you still in or have you completely aged out, Ken? Uh, aged out. Aged out, okay, so we'll get to you as a uh, uh, guest. And uh, Kenneth is uh, interested in joining our club, so I've invited awesome. him to come and have breakfast with us. Yeah. Hopefully, we don't scare him away. He's got a good company there. Uh, <laughs> I see we have uh, Holly back over here. And uh, thank you for returning. Thanks. Yes, at this time, I know uh, we have a new member, and uh, we're going to get to that right now, actually. Uh, AJ and Melinda, would you like to conduct our newest member? Sorry to interrupt your breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. It's all about you. Um, fellow Rotarians, it is my privilege and pleasure today to conduct this induction ceremony to bring a new member to the group. Um, Sarah Heller was proposed for membership by Belinda Dammy Hinton. Her proposal has been reviewed by the membership committee in accordance with their club constitution and bylaws. Her name has been circulated and her application for membership has been approved. <laughs> <laughs> Rotary is defined as a volunteer organization of business and professional leaders united worldwide to provide humanitarian service and build, help build goodwill and peace. Club members meet weekly to plan service projects, discuss community and international issues, and enjoy fellowship. Uh, clubs are non religious, non political, and open to individuals' diverse backgrounds. Rotary encourages high ethical standards. In all vocations while striving to live and work by the four way test. Let's try it again. This is the truth. This is the truth. all concerns. Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerns? Uh, Sarah, we now proceed to admit you into membership in Rotary Club Arcade Center. Sarah, we welcome you back to the friendship of Rotary throughout the world. Um, Something I learned in the uh, uh, membership meeting was she was formerly part of the um, noon club. So, welcome back. Yeah. The ideal of the is service, which is why our, <laughs> our motto is service above self. And the object of this club and the whole Rotary Club is to encourage and foster this ideal as a basis of worthy enterprise. You are to share in this effort. So you've been approved for membership in the club because we believe you to be a worthy representative of your vocation, are interested in the ideals of Rotary, and are willing to do your share in translating these ideals to action. You've agreed to accept the obligations of membership in this club as people of action and to obey our club's constitution and bylaws. So now I have the pleasure of asking your sponsor to pin on your membership pin, the emblem of the Rotary wheel, which we hope you will wear with pride of being a Rotarian but also with the ability of service. If she can get it opened up. <laughs> Are you sure? It won't come off. chance. Is this the logo? Thank <laughs> you. At this time, I'd like to present you with your red badge, the symbol of a new club member. As a new member, there is a path you will follow as you achieve your blue badge status, and I know you will achieve this in a timely manner. This new member packet contains information for you about our Rotary Club and about Rotary International. You will have many questions in the coming weeks, and I encourage you to seek the answers from your sponsor, uh, your mentor, Terry, <laughs> members of the membership committee, and the club president, or the entire club. My pleasure on behalf of the uh, board of directors and the entire club membership to welcome you to the Rotary Club of Arcadia Stone. Yeah. 
always a worry in July because they come to the meeting there's almost nobody there it's happened ever since 1992 so don't feel like it's not you it isn't you I mean every president has ever done that like they come to their first meeting there's like 10 people out there and they go crap what did I do you know that's just July okay. thanks Greg thanks Ian thank you welcome we're happy to have you with us <laughs> okay, up next we have some uh, repeats on Save the Dates. And uh, did Carol arrive? Uh, I don't see Carol yet. Anyhow, I, I I'm here you. on Zoom. Oh, there you are. Hi, hi Carol. Would you like <laughs> to here. take a couple moments and tell us what's uh, happening with tide pooling with Carol? All right. Sorry, everybody, that I couldn't make that in person. But if you are an early bird, this Sunday morning, if you get up early, like we all are here at 7 a.m. at the harbor um, in Trinidad, I'll be leading a tide pool exploration for all abilities. If you're not the type who want to crawl over all the slippery rocks, the harbor is an awesome place to be able to take in the tide pool creatures. And that's part of my work with the Trinidad Coastal Land Trust, which I yeah. the education and the, uh, the uh, environment. And it's an extremely low tide that morning. And we have room. If you want to come, you could um, send me a text. You could call the office because we try to limit it to keep it to small groups. But it starts at 7 a.m. this Sunday morning at the harbor. So um i'd love to see carol I, I understand this is a uh, relatively accessible it uh, is um well it's not strictly ada accessible karen will talk to you about that but uh we do have access to a beach wheelchair and if you go down in front of the seascape it's a pretty easy slope there's a couple little rocky parts um but we've had great success um with the wheelchair and people who are you know mobility limited can still enjoy checking out the tide pool creatures so we're trying to make this one an easy tide pool walk and um it's really fun it's a beautiful place one year we saw an octopus and uh some fun. pretty cool creatures so uh, just send me a, a text, an email, and I'll put you on the list. Perfect. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, do you, I know we all got an email about your uh, pizza party. Do you have any, any additional did. details? Just come on. You can learn how to make your own pizzas or make them for you or whatever. And we're going to have a tiki bar out there. And my son's going to make some drinks if anybody wants to talk to him. And have some fun in the backyard. Join us at 4 o'clock on Saturday, the 31st. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Please, please RSVP to Romy if you anticipate being there. No, no RSVP, no dough. Don't. You just need to know how much dough. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, would you come on up? I, I know there's a few things you wanted to say about our upcoming first fundraiser of our Rotary year. Can I take this down up here? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So the Sunrise Summer Sale, we know the 14th and 15th, most likely the weekend before, we're gonna coordinate dropping everything off at Maggie's house. So we'll give you those exact details on when the drop-off time is. So you all, just like last week, go rummage through those closets and those garage and find great stuff. If you have large things and you wanna sell them on Craigslist or you wanna sell them on Facebook and then donate the money to the Sunrise Summer Sale, that's always nice because then you don't have to move it twice, right? From your house to the sale and to someone else's house. So if you don't think that you want to hold on for your stuff for a couple of weeks, you could always sell it online and then donate it to the Sunrise Summer Sale. So 
Ruby? Thank you. And you hey, wanted Ruby. you wanted uh, emails to preview things that might be available for the sales, all right? Yeah, you can send okay. us the email. Let us know what you're thinking about bringing so we know we have enough stuff to sell. <laughs> right. Thank you for putting that together. You and Claire are doing a great job. Uh, AJ, was it you that sent out something about our golf tournament, our summer scramble? So uh, we had a meeting again yesterday, um, and uh, things were moving along. We're finding some vendors for uh, some of the spots along the golf tournament. So um, we're going to create some themes, I think, in three little camp spots where we have a good mix of food and drink and uh, some games. But um, for from the club, uh, if you haven't sent us the $25, that'll help us with the cash prize and to help us with the, the bar prize. Um, that would be great if you could Venmo or send a check. Um, and then uh, I just sent out a sign-up genius. It's a really generic sign-up genius. We're trying to assess how many uh, volunteers we're gonna get from the club. Because it's gonna be important for some of the games that we have set up that we have uh, people to be able to take the bet and then um, rate the bet at the very end of the hole. Um, that just helps with an efficient uh, game process and help us with tabulating um, the entries into our grand prizes. So um, if you haven't seen the kind of units, you can take a look. And if you're free that day, great to see uh, great to see you out there. And um, if you have any questions, we have to reach out to Melinda or I. And um, yeah, thank you. Are we still looking for full sponsors? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. So reach out to uh, the folks you know in our community and uh, AJ and Melinda, do you have some information you can send for what the ask is? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will actually, I think, uh, um, Barbara's going to be sending out some stuff too. We're just editing the poster from last year, just a few things, trying to get um, just up to the information on that. I want to be confirmed surprises and everything. Um, so that should be coming around by next week, and then okay. it kind of has all the information, but I'll put additional so um, Barbara and Maggie for PR can get that. Those. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Friends on Zoom, there's yeah. more information on that coming soon. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of friends on Zoom, I've just been told that uh, we have a guest from France. Tamar, are you there? And can you unmute and say hi for just a second? We have 17 people online, but just sending out. Okay, where is Tamar? There you are, Tamar. I, I can't see on video. Are, are you able to uh, say hi? I, I, we can't quite hear you. Maybe you stepped away for breakfast, seeing all of us eating. <laughs> okay, carrying on then. Um, are, uh, yes, please help me out um, here. Nera's here. Hello, Nera. Hi, Nera. Thanks for joining us again. It, it, we're and happy to see you every week. Our guest uh, speaker. Uh, well, there's Karen. Karen Fowler is there. Hi, Karen. We'll do a formal introduction. Uh, Karen will be our presenter today from uh, Accessibility. Uh, she's the ADA coordinator for Humble, and uh, we're, we look forward to hearing from you uh, later in the meeting. Yeah, okay. I'll let you know when you come back here. Thank you. Okay, I, I wanted to talk today about a little bit about uh, fellowship outside the club. Um, you know, we, we all obviously join in part Rotary to connect with people in our communities. And, uh, you know, through youth exchange or other opportunities in uh, Rotary, there's many ways that we can connect beyond our club and beyond our local community with people that share our interests or maybe have interests that we are interested in learning more about. And so uh, Rotary currently has uh, on the, the My Rotary website about almost 100 different sorts of fellowships. And I know you can't read all those from where you are, uh, but there are pretty much interests that may spark a, a little uh, curiosity in just about anybody. And the cool thing about the Rotary uh, Fellowships is that if there's not one you're interested in, there's uh, full instructions on how to create your own. 
And so this morning, I wanted to uh, invite a couple of our club members who are involved with Rotary Fellowships outside the club to talk about that. Um, first up, we have Maggie, and I, I think we may see a lot of interest in this one. You want to come on up, Maggie? <laughs> Yes, hi. I joined the Whiskey Fellowship. I know nothing about whiskey, um, but it's an alcoholic beverage, so I thought I would check it out. Um, and I went to the first meeting uh, during the convention, and they had about, oh, I don't know, maybe 100 people online from all over the world. Uh, everyone was drinking whiskey, and they would introduce themselves and tell them what, tell us what they were drinking. And people in Australia, it might have been 8 o'clock in the morning, but everyone was doing it. And uh, it just seems really fun, learn a lot about different whiskeys. And I think we could start a local, we could start a local group if we want. They encourage you to meet four times a year at least and do like whiskey tastings. Also, if we want to do a fundraiser, we can raffle off whiskey and raise money. So uh, it just is interesting because whiskey is such a big thing. I mean, it's such a, there's so many types of whiskey that you could never, you can never finish this club. This, I mean, you could never be done with it. So I have my pin and I realized I put it on this outfit so you cannot possibly see it. But, it but, looks just uh, like the, uh, the yeah, it does. It looks yeah. just like that. And it's, um, and it's, I think it's 30, 45 a year or 35 a year or a hundred for lifetime membership. So, um, anyway, if anyone wants more information, they can go and check it out. If anyone wants to join and start a local branch here let me know we can do that and that would be kind of fun so thank you what whiskey were you drinking? well i actually i was there without whiskey because i was listening to everybody and then when they were done i went and bought two different bottles of whiskey because <laughs> because you're supposed to like compare and then i realized i'm supposed to have three bottles of whiskey to compare and they're all supposed to be the same they're supposed to be the same type so so i ended up having like four bottles of whiskey that I was tasting evenly, which meant when they were empty, they were all empty at the same time, um, which meant I was putting like all these bottles, empty bottles of whiskey into my recycling. So I'm not gonna do that again. I'm gonna do one at a time. So I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm learning, I'm learning. So I, I understand this is a good way to find a friend to have a drink with pretty much anywhere in the world. That's right. Yeah, okay. you could go anywhere in the world and and find somebody in this club who is willing to show you their the best whiskey that they know in their in their country. So it's kind of fun. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Next, we have Terry, uh, maybe a little uh, rambunctious, I guess, or, or maybe not so. Never been to a quilting party. <laughs> Is there drinking involved? So the quilting it started off as just the quilting fellowship. I brought show and tell. Um, and my trusty assistant here. So the quilting fellowship started off as just quilting, and then the knitters and the crocheters and the other fabric artists got kind of peevish, and so now it's it's a broader thing. Um, every year when there's a real convention, international convention, the quilters will have a booth and they will sell items that we've made to um, benefit the Rotary Foundation. Um, now we're meeting on Zoom and it is fun because it's from all over the world. Even though quilting, it, it's kind of an American thing, but the English people will say it started there, but whatever. So it's really fun and it's interesting to see what people do. Um, I learned to quilt in 1978, and I brought the very first quilt I ever made. Um, so in those days, uh, the, the hobby, the pastime was technologically challenged. Um, we traced the pattern onto cardboard pieces and then traced each cardboard piece onto fabric and cut them out individually. Um, I did hand quilt it. The other thing about it is that um, fabrics weren't as, uh, really great fabrics weren't as readily available. So part of this is polyester cotton, but you know, it's, oh, it's old and it's held up pretty well. And so I'm happy. And just as quilting technology has gotten better, so have my skills. <laughs> So this was one I made at the very first Linda Ballard quilting retreat I ever went to. It was a mystery retreat. 
And what that means is we got the instructions of what kinds of fabric, what colors we're going to go with, what colors, how much to buy, depending on what size we wanted. But we didn't know what the quilt was going to look like until we got there and we're already started. So um, the important part for me on that is just to buy fabric that I like and then whatever it turns out to be. I like it whether the pattern is really, you know, super cool or not. Uh, last year during COVID, I made 26 quilts. Um, well, what else was there to do? <laughs> and for those of you who have been to my house, you know, you'll believe me when I tell you that I um, almost bought no fabric in 2020. I just pulled it from my considerable, beautiful stash. And uh, it makes me happy. It's a happy place. Yes, it's a happy place. It's a happy place. So anyway, the, the fellowship is great. Um, I urge you to check out all the different fellowships. Marty's in the surfing fellowship. He's a charter member of the, it was a new one that, that he helped get start started. And it's just a way to connect. And especially now when everything's happening virtually, anyway, if you're not going to go to an international convention, you can get together with the other like-minded folks. So it's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> when, when we're done with this part, I will uh, share out the website. Go ahead, Terry. I, I'm sorry, Maggie. Tamal, you're back. Would you like to say hello uh, for a moment, Sma? No. Oh, there he is. I don't know if you can hear me. Yay! Yay. Well, I don't know if you can see me, too. I, I yes. have no idea. We've okay. got you. <laughs> I can see my face, but it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm working How on are you, Tama? Well, I'm good. I'm uh, off work today. I found a job. I'm a cook. Uh, I'm making food for people. It's very nice. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah. Excellent. I also really miss California. I I've seen there is uh, an exchange student from Alaska that came uh, in Aquila. I think Nina, she's here, I think. She's visiting him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Excellent. Okay. Nice. Well, I'm I'm pretty excited. I I want to go back actually, but I don't know yet. Uh, but I will figure that out. I think. <laughs> well, we're not going anywhere, so anytime. <laughs> yeah, great. And, uh, Maggie and Claire tell me that you'd like to uh, come back and talk about what's going on with your life at a, a yeah, I can meeting, definitely so. do that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, thanks for <laughs> dropping in. It's good to see your face. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Bye. Bye. And then, uh, is there anybody else that's currently involved with the Rotary, Rotary Fellowship that I'm not aware of? Thought I picked y'all up. Not yet. Okay, we're going to work on that. Uh, there's a couple I'm involved with, uh, and they may seem contrasting. One is the uh, Rotarian Metalhead Fellowship, and uh, there's, there's there's a little and there is a tie-in between these two groups. Um, there's a little bit of a backstory there. When I was growing up, until I was 12 or 13, um, I had no radio access uh, because we couldn't receive it out of Maple Creek. And um, my music was limited to what my parents listened to. So I, I grew up knowing the Moody Blues and Emerson Lake and Palmer and uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. And then uh, I think I was 13. Um, I discovered in the back of the cabinet, there were these tape things, you know, we used records. And, there were some tapes back there and uh, one of them said iron butterfly and i asked my dad what's this and he said well just play it and i was like what is this <laughs> and then he, he saw that i kind of liked it so uh, he brought out uh um black sabbath and uh, a few others uh, from his era and uh, said yeah i did some photo shoots at some of these concerts and i still have tinnitus and uh, so it was it was kind of a uh a, awakening so to speak and so i think jeff is probably the only person in the room that ever saw my room at home in maple creek kind of a shrine to uh circus magazine and all the whack crazy outfits and guitars that everybody would have on stage i, I think i had the whole walls plastered with photos of that <clears throat> and so I've, I've been into metal music for a long time uh, i like a lot of different variety of music but one thing that i definitely appreciate with metal music is that if I've had a hard day, I can get to my car, turn on the radio, put some on, and I'm waiting along, and I'm good when I get home. So, and a lot of the, 
a lot of metal music is actually uh, very uh, socially conscious and aware. Um, not all of it, but <laughs> much of it is, and what I listen to. But the, the Rotary metal, Metalhead Fellowship just had their first uh, invite to host a uh, part of the convention, which was pretty cool. And uh, they support the Wacken Foundation, which is basically an open door to anybody who's in music and feels like they're not getting that break to get in the door for metal music, because it's kind of pushed aside as, a, oh, that's not serious music. So that's how I, um, I became interested in that particular fellowship. And the tie-in uh, to the other fellowship I'm involved with, which is actually my favorite pin, is the LGBT Plus Fellowship, is that in uh, 1998 on MTV, uh, one of my favorite rockers, uh, Rob Halford, came out as gay uh, on MTV. And when he talked about it, he talked about the astounding relief he felt at just being free of that secret. And uh, the reason that I found and joined this fellowship is that it occurred to me that that's not that long ago, what, 23 years or so, that somebody felt that they had to hide who they were. And uh, more recently with my own kids, uh, one of whom is um, uh, non-binary and the other is trans mass. And it was still, even just last year, hard for them to come to me and say, dad, this is who I am. And it just hit me that it shouldn't be hard. They, they know me, they know that I'm somebody they can trust and yet it was still hard for them to come to their family and, and say something. So um, the LGBT plus uh, fellowship encourages within Rotary us to make a welcoming space for everybody to feel comfortable being who they are. So that's, that's why I'm involved in those two fellowships in particular. Um, my presidential challenge for you, challenge for you is uh, go, I'll share the website after the meeting, uh, go and find something that is of interest to you or that you're curious about and sign up. Um, the, the dues are usually very low, although the, I think the highest one I found is actually the Rotarian Metal Hub Fellowship. Uh, if you want to subscribe your whole family, it's $666. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so we will be asking, uh, everybody in the club will get a chance to talk about a fellowship they found uh, throughout the rest of the year uh, and into next year. And I encourage you all to reach out beyond the club and see what else Rotary has to offer. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Karen Clover. Clover. Um, excuse me, Karen. Uh, Charlie couldn't be here this morning to introduce you, so she sent me a little bit of information, so bear with me here. Uh, Karen has been a lifelong uh, resident of Humboldt County and has dedicated her career to public service, and I think that's an important thing to, to pause on in that our county and uh, other government employees really if they're in the right frame of mind, like Karen, our public servants, they're here to serve us and the needs of the community. Um, Karen's been employed with the County of Humboldt for 29 years, holding many positions, but currently she's the Deputy, Administrative, <clears throat> Deputy County Administrative Officer for the county's and the county's first certified ADA coordinator. When she's not at work, she spends her time volunteering for California Cancer Crusher as their board's chairperson and enjoying time with her family this time of year seeking the sun in Willow Creek. Karen, uh, if you are there and can unmute, go ahead and uh, take us away with your presentation. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, um, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. Um, I do have my notes on my screen, so I can't see you all right now, but I'm impressed at the turnout at seven o'clock in the morning. That's impressive. <laughs> Um, so this morning, I will share with you some information about the ADA, some of what we have learned as the county, and leave you some time for question and answer. Um, September of 2018, I received my ADA coordinator certification from the Great Plains ADA Center, but let me tell you why. September 7th of 2016, the county entered into a 3.5-year consent decree with the Department of Justice. I recall writing the agenda item for our board to sign the consent decree 
at that time, I was a project manager for the county, and I kept thinking, boy, am I glad this is not my project. <laughs> months later, <laughs> months later, this became my project. I had a lot to learn. I, from the terminology, by the way, handicapped is not politically correct. Um, ADA code, California building code, tools of the trade. If you know any trades people, the two foot level continues to be a hot topic. Um, I have almost as many pictures of my family and friends on my phone as I do non-ADA compliant toilets, bathroom fixtures, parking stalls, and service counters now. Um, so what is the ADA? The ADA is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life. Disability to be protected by the ADA, one must have a disability which is defined uh, by the ADA as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. There are five titles of the ADA. Title one is employment. So employers out there with 15 or more employees must comply with the ADA um, title one. Title two is state and local governments, and that's um, where I am most familiar. All uh, state and local, local government programs, services, and activities, policies, and practices must be in compliance with the ADA. And if there's any local government folks in the room, um, the ADA does require uh, local governments with 50 or more employees to have an ADA coordinator. Title three of the ADA is public accommodations in, and in commercial facilities. This title sets the minimum standards for accessibility for alterations and new construction of facilities. It also requires public accommodations to remove barriers in existing buildings where it's easy to do so without much difficulty or expense or readily achievable. The readily achievable is one of the major differences between Title III and Title II of the ADA. So with the consent decree, the county was required to move, remove uh, specified barriers in 58 facilities, then all barriers to access in all county facilities that provided a, a program service or activity to the public. The, a, the consent to keep decree required um, the county to provide our staff training on the ADA, but we took that a step further and provided training to local building officials, contractors, architects, and property owners. Of course, the county appointed an ADA coordinator. Um, the county had to bring specified curb ramps into compliance with the ADA. We're still working on our curb ramp project and we'll talk a little bit more about the barriers to our facilities. We had to evaluate all of our polling sites and all of our emergency sheltering sites for compliance with the ADA. We had to bring our website into compliance. The county did adopt a website accessibility policy and we um, contract with a third party vendor to ensure our website stays in compliance. We adopted an effective communication policy. We adopted a service animal policy. Uh, service animals are dogs or miniature horses that are trained to perform a task for the benefit of someone with a disability. Yes, I said miniature horse. I have not seen one, but yes, a miniature horse is a service animal as well. And there's two questions that you can ask um, somebody entering your um, place of business or your uh, local government agency is if the service animal is required because of a disability. If the answer is yes to that question, then you can ask what the specific task is that that animal has been trained to perform. And that uh, task should be something um, that helps this person with their disability. Um, there's a wide range of um, tasks a dog 
can be trained to perform. And we have that policy. It is available online as well as our effective communication policy and our website accessibility policy. So if you want uh, more detailed descriptions, you can find it there or you can email me or call me. What we discovered through the consent decree is that um, the nearest, uh, when assessing our facilities, um, we had to go to the nearest bus stop. From that nearest bus stop to the entrance of the building, um, through some of the cities that um, took quite a bit of an assessment of parking, um, parking areas, of sidewalks, curb ramps, um, and all of those reports have been provided to the cities and local jurisdictions as well as the county. We've, we discovered that parking stalls were not fully in compliance for a variety of reasons. Um, most of our parking stalls were not compliant because of the striping on asphalt had worn off or the asphalt had settled, um, making it an, an uneven surface. So when we uh, redo our parking stalls, we now do them um, with concrete instead of uh, the asphalt. Doors, um, our doors must be under five pounds of pressure um, to open. We have a difficult time maintaining that pressure. Um, so we either remove our door closers where we can, but you can't in a multi-user restroom, um, or we regularly adjust and test the closure or install automatic door openers. You'll notice that most of our storefronts have the automatic door openers now because we just can't maintain that uh, five pounds or less of pressure. Our bathrooms, um, most of our bathrooms are not ADA compliant. We're not ADA compliant at the time. We've done a lot of remodeling to restrooms. Um, one of the big differences that we discovered between the ADA and the California Building Code was dispensers and restrooms. Um, the California Building Code was more stringent than the ADA re uh, requiring that the the um, actuator or the device mechanism to um, operate had to be at 40 inches versus 48 inches. Other issues we see in restrooms are toilet center lines, grab bars not positioned correctly. And yes, we've even seen a towel rack used as a grab bar. Don't do that. Um, bathroom stall. So the accessible bathroom stall wasn't wide enough. It didn't provide for a five foot turning radius, um, all of this. Um, we look at different ways to solve these issues, um, determining whether we wanna use a single user accessible restroom um, or multi-use uh, restrooms and make the accessible stall fully compliant. Protruding objects, this is something that's easy to fix. Um, anything in a circulation path that's above 28, 27 inches and below 80 inches that protrudes more than four inches is a protruding object. We see this on sidewalks where tree limbs are hanging down below 80 inches, easy to fix by trimming the tree. Fire extinguishers in buildings that are mounted with the leading edge, so the bottom of the dispenser is just um, above that 27 inch mark easy to fix by lowering. And most recently, hand sanitizer dispensers, we see that everywhere now. If they're on a wall in the circulation path, typically they stick out more than uh, four inches from the wall. So you'll notice, um, for example, in the courthouse underneath our hand sanitizer dispensers, We have these like they're part of the wall now, um, but that creates a detectable warning for those dispensers. Uh, reach ranges, uh, this, a reach range is between 15 and 48 inches to the control point. So wherever you would grab your brochure or your magazine, 
um, needs to be within 15 to 48 inches. And we see this issue a lot on brochure racks. Fairly easy to remedy by making sure one of each brochure is within the reach range. Not all brochures um, have to be lined up together, but you need to make sure that at least one of them, one of each type is within those reach ranges. Um, the reach ranges become a little bit more difficult with drop boxes and things of that nature, but you can remedy those. Signs. Um, we have probably replaced thousands of signs and we continue to replace signs throughout our facilities. Um, our biggest um, barrier was the fact that the braille on our sign was not spaced correctly. Um, there is a requirement for the size and the spacing of braille on signs. Um, so we did have to go through and replace those. So where you need the tactile signs or the braille and raised character signs is generally um, rooms that are identifying space. So your accessible restrooms, um, your office spaces. So if somebody is coming to your building um, to meet with you, they need to be able to identify that space. Uh, signs that direct people to and from um, other permanent rooms or functional spaces. They, they're visual signs. They don't require the raised characters. Um, signs that direct to and from accessible features and elements. Um, these also are visual signs, so they don't require the tactile or braille characters, but they do direct people to accessible locations and they have the a symbol of accessibility on those signs. Those would be used to direct people from a non-ADA uh, restroom to an ADA compliant restroom or from uh, drinking fountains to the accessible drinking fountains, things like that. Um, sometimes you'll find them on the exterior of a building and that's directing um, people to the accessible entrance of the building. Um, other signs that don't are not required to comply with the ADA include temporary signage directories. So in your lobby areas, your directories are not required to be fully ADA compliant and menus and small restaurants are not required to be fully ADA compliant. Another area we see um, issues with a lot is clear floor space. Um, we see these mainly at the doors and we call um, a lot of our trash cans and restrooms floating trash cans because they tend to move around um, the room and end up right at the door. Um, so those you need to have clear floor space um, of 18 inches on the pull side or 12 inches on the push side of the door. Another barrier we see with clear floor space is oversized furniture in uh, office spaces. Um, the problem with that is that it blocks a five foot diameter turning radius or blocks the door from being able to open to a full 90 degrees. Drinking fountains is another barrier we've discovered where we have plenty of drinking fountains in the building, but they were all mounted at the same height. So we don't have that high, low option. Um, the county has chosen to replace the majority of its drinking fountains with the high, low combination and the hydration station. It's an added feature, uh, mainly for uh, staff and the public coming into our buildings. Um, the hydration stations are not a requirement and they do not fully meet the ADA alone. You do have to have that high and low option. Our elevators, um, they weren't compliant either. Um, we didn't have the silent call feature for somebody who couldn't speak if they were stuck in the elevator. Um, we didn't have the audible sounds. Um, so each time the elevator hits the floor, it should ding or say what floor it's on. Um, both of those have been remedied and were remedied right away. We had to look at our parks. Um, the county has several parks. Um, and what we have chosen to do is view our parks in their entirety.
to determine where our accessible parks would be. Uh, Clam Beach is one of our accessible parks. It has accessible restrooms, camping, and beach wheelchairs. Although what we discovered with our beach wheelchairs is that our sand is so fine and soft that in the soft sand, it was really hard to push the wheelchairs in the soft sand. So we are looking at a project to uh, provide a beach wheelchair mat that will run from the parking lot at Clam Beach out to the high tide line, uh, making it much easier for individuals with mobility disabilities to uh, maneuver on, in the sand. Um, once you hit the hard pack, the wheelchair works fine on that. It's just the soft sand where we've seen the problem. And then of course, Freshwater Park um, has our largest playground in all of our parks, in our park system. And that we uh, modified the playground completely to make it an inclusive playground. So all the equipment on our playground is ADA compliant. And we've done part, uh, improvements to our other parts as well and continue to do so. Uh, we've learned about ramps versus sloped walkways, 5% uh, running slope versus an 8.3% running slope. And in one of our facilities, um, we like to call it the ski slope because we don't even know the running slope of that ramp. Um, it is so steep. When our licensed architect came to evaluate that facility for ADA compliance, she just walked away and marked it not compliant. Luckily, we do have another entrance um, that is actually the accessible entrance to the building, but um, learning about ramps and sloped walkways was quite fascinating. Um, we've done so much. We continue to work on our airports. Um, we are now partnering with uh, Redwood Community Energy Authority and the Shots Energy Group to provide um, electric vehicle charging stations at our main airport um, and then create the accessible path of travel from those parking stalls to the entrance of the building. So we're pretty excited about that. It will be the first charging stations that we put in um, as one of our projects. Um, in closing, um, I am grateful to have had the opportunity to learn about the ADA and make improvements to our services that make our programs accessible to all. I have a great team of people that I get to work with every day. Um, that focuses on ADA compliance for the county. Um, we're not done yet though. In June, the Board of Supervisors adopted the county's 20 year compliance plan. Just gonna say I'll be retired before we're done with that, but it is a move in the right direction to keep us focused on the importance of ADA in our county programs. And with that, I am glad if you're all are still awake to answer any questions. Thank you, Karen. That's great. And uh, hopefully you didn't even see our technical difficulties. Uh, so uh, I've switched laptops. Can you hear me at this time? Yes, I can. Perfect. Uh, I have a uh, first question. What resources would you point people to to help uh, property owners make their facilities more accessible, even if it's not required? Um, the ADA has um, extensive amounts of information on the, on the internet. Um, we have links to different um, resources that I could provide anybody, but the um, Access Board, the United States Access Board is a great resource for questions the California uh, State Department of Architects, the DSA, another very helpful um, place um, that we utilize all the time. And then uh, most people don't know about the Pacific ADA Center. They are focused in uh, San Francisco and the Oakland area, um, but they are our region's resource for ADA questions, um, and they provide a tremendous amount of training, um, and they're a great resource um, for 
property owners and any businesses too that have questions about the ADA. Thank you. Any questions from the room? Howard. Uh, Aaron, could you suggest terminology that would be suitable to replace words such as handicap or disability? In case you couldn't hear, he, Howard's asking, uh, could you suggest words that are more suitable and appropriate uh, to replace words that have been used in the past, such as uh, handicapped or disabled? Uh, so what I learned from um, the ADA is that using person first um, is the most uh, proper way to address a person with disability. Um, so instead of using the word handicap, handicap it's person or persons with disabilities, person or persons with mobility disabilities, or uh, person or wheelchair users. Um, but using that person first is the most acceptable way. And using the word accessibility in place of handicapped is most appropriate. Michael? Um, along the same lines, on the ADA site, is there a vocab list? that everybody can go to. Is there a vocabulary list on the uh, County ADA site? Yeah, um, in our, um, it's in different locations. Um, most of our policies have some kind of a uh, definitions list. Um, I can certainly provide that to anybody who is interested in that. Um, we have, we provide it to our staff training, so it's more in our training materials, but we could certainly put that out there to our website. Um, or you can reach out to me at ada at co.humboldt.ca.us or by calling our main office number, which is 707-445-7266. And anybody on the ADA team can help you with that. We can put it on our website. Thank you. Any other questions? Anyone on the Zoom side have any questions? Okay. Karen, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, for our presenters, and uh, it's especially appropriate for you today, we make a donation to the Wheelchair Foundation uh, on behalf, uh, in your name. Uh, which provides uh, wheelchairs for people that could not otherwise uh, afford or have access to them. So thank you very much for presenting today. We appreciate the work you do and uh, appreciate you being here so early in the morning. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And thank you for making that donation. Nick, are you ready for a raffle? Because I need some cover to switch laptops. <laughs> Next one up. And we're back. Thank you. Four, seven, three. <laughs> uh, that's not All right. Hey. All right. Again. Oh, we got five. We got five more. There you go, boss. Thank you. Thank you. Nick do, you, Nick, do you know what the pot is for next $40. week? $40. Next $40. All right. All right. Time in every week. Uh, real quick, we have a board update. Uh, your board met and did quite a bit of work uh, last Tuesday. Uh, obviously, thank you very much for uh, accepting and going along with our, our mask request for our meetings. We also decided to, sorry? Thanks for keeping us safe. We're trying. It's a weird world. Um, and also, we decided, uh, based on current attendance and sign-up trends, 
we're going to hold our uh, catering, catering commitment to 35 and the room to 40 until we see more demand for a few weeks. So uh, keep signing up, please. Everybody who uh, wants to attend in person, you're welcome. Please sign up. Um, we also uh, added uh, funding for the Public Relations Committee. Uh, so uh, Maggie and Barbara are tearing that up and have some great ideas. We met last night and talked over all the stuff that we're going to do, including rebranding our website, uh, finally. Uh, club bylaws, uh, the board has formed an ad hoc committee to uh, review our bylaws specifically related to attendance. So that will be coming in December to for club consideration, and we'll vote on it early next year. And then uh, one of our longtime members, uh, Linda Moore, had uh, applied for what's called the Rule of 85. 20 years of service plus age equals 85 in Rotary. Uh, removes any requirement, uh, requirements for attendance. In practice, right now, our bylaws do not match what we do. So that's why we're, uh, as a committee, <clears throat> looking at our bylaws related to attendance. But uh, that, that was approved from Linda. So uh, that's the board update real quick. And then uh, closed meeting. I just had a thought for you regarding fellowship. So please do sign up for uh, the fellowship uh, opportunities that Rotary offers. And uh, what are we counting? <laughs> you, you're counting my face. Oh. <laughs> okay, Scott, I see you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate you joining from remote and in person. And we'll conclude our meeting. There's a little bit of social time. Thank you.